Canadian-born economist David Card is one of three winners of this year's Nobel Prize in Economics. This first order condition has to be true. Okay, now if we only have Card's research has challenged commonly held beliefs. He's found increasing minimum wage does not reduce hiring numbers and immigrants do not cause wages to go down in any given country. Card, who grew up on a farm near Guelph, Ontario, shares the prize with two other economists, an American and an Israeli. David Card is a professor of economics now at the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Card, good to have you on the program and first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. So let me guess, uh, last 24 hours you've got lots of sleep, your phone's been quiet, no emails have been coming in, no knocks at the door, nobody's saying anything. Very uh, peaceful time for you? Oh yeah, one of the one of the best. Yeah. So your your work, and I uh, I don't want to try to oversimplify, but here I go. Um, your, your work uh, that you're being honored for by the Nobel Committee looks at a couple of things. One of them is around the minimum wage and the the old uh, belief by some that if you increase the minimum wage, jobs are going to be lost, and you disprove that uh, in in your research. And another part of it is, and forgive again the oversimplification, but that immigrants steal jobs. And you, your research goes on to to disprove that. When you that that is work that, that you did, to, you know, two and a half decades ago. When you look at it today, do you see an enormous amount of relevance? Um, well, I guess relevant in two ways. One, um, since the, uh, for example, on the minimum wage, since the work that I did back in the early 90s. Um, there's really been an enormous explosion of research, um, not just in the United States, uh, some in Canada, lots in Britain. Uh, in the last few years, Germany introduced a minimum wage, and there was a, been a, a lot of studies. And I would say, you know, most of the uh, evidence from those studies has more or less confirmed the original results we got, but it's also provided a lot of insights into how the minimum wage affects uh, different kinds of workers, for instance, black workers relative to white workers in the U.S. context. There's, a, there's enormous political relevance to this um, because it is, it is so often used, certainly in the United States, but not exclusively in the United States, by political forces, business forces, and other, others. Uh, and, and you actually were the, the, the landmark case. Your, your work says, no, this thing that is spouted off simply is not true. Do you, do you feel that it has made a, a, an enormous difference in the way that the Nobel Committee clearly thinks it has? Uh, I don't know. I, I hesitate to speak for the committee. I think um, probably what they were um, commending wasn't directly necessarily something to do with the minimum wage itself, but rather the idea of the of the methodology that we proposed, which was you know really very straightforward. We we surveyed a bunch of restaurant fast food restaurants on the two sides of the Delaware River in New Jersey and Pennsylvania before the minimum wage in New Jersey went up, and then resurveyed the same restaurants again um, nine, ten months later, and then we just constructed an analysis and said, well, is it really true that in New Jersey where the minimum wage went up, there was a lot a lot of losses of employment or stores that closed, that kind of thing? You know, I, I, I sort of think as we fast forward now into this time of the pandemic that we are once again talking about the minimum wage, and in some jurisdictions it's necessarily been forced up just because of labor shortages that are in, in play. Is that something that, that fascinates you as an economist? Actually, that's one of the follow-throughs uh, follow from the, our work on the minimum wage. I, I'm mentioning our work because it was work I did with Alan Kruger, who mm. passed away a couple of years ago, but um, was at my colleague at Princeton for many years. Um, we argued that the way to understand the labor market and the responses of, to the minimum wage was to think about a, a slightly different view of the labor market and think of, okay, firms are really setting wages, think, taking account of different forces. And um, one of the things we noticed when we did our study back in 1992 was there were a lot of stores that said, uh, you know, had a, had a wage that they were set, and yet uh, they had a, a bonuses for new workers. They had uh, uh, signs and incentives to try and get people to come in the door. And economists will say, well, why don't you just raise the wage? And of course, the answer is, if you raise the wage, you will get some extra workers, but you have to pay more for the people mm -hmm. you already have in the house. Uh, and so 
it'll, it'll often be in that setting, which is more or less what we have today and throughout North America and some places in Europe, is you, you have a situation where uh, there's a kind of a shortage of workers, but an individual firm is nevertheless not raising wages uh, as high as they could go in order to capture some of the um, returns to having an existing workforce. Do you see that changing? I, I think that's always how the labor market has worked, more, especially when there's um, relatively good times for workers. So, you know, relatively more um, firms looking for workers than there are people willing to work. Um, uh, by the way, I would say, you know, I've been doing some work comparing Canada and the U.S. and the responses to the COVID, and Canada has done pretty well. I mean, not perfect, but um, the labor market is bouncing back a lot faster in Canada than it is in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know your work is not political um, in and of itself, but of course it, it, it would be cited by politicians. And I, I kind of wonder where, where you sit when you look, and again, particularly in the United States, not exclusively, where so many jurisdictions have been resistant to increasing the minimum wage. It's, it's not fundamentally, it's not like it's five times what it was back in the 90s when you were doing this research. What goes through your mind when you see that level of resistance to raising the minimum wage? Well, I mean, you know, in all honesty, there's resistance to vaccinations. There's resistance to doing something about climate change. There's a lot of resistance to any kind of change that's going to disrupt the order. Um, so you can't, as a researcher, you can't really expect, um, you know, that people are going to necessarily not ignore their own self-interest. And, and, you know, there's lots of for example, the example we were talking about of a firm that is re trying to recruit new workers but has a relatively low wage for the people that already is hired, mm -hmm. they have strong incentives not to raise the wage because they're making some money on that. They have, it, there's a kind of a trade-off between wages of workers and profits of firms. I've got to ask you, and it's just a curiosity because we don't get many Nobel laureates that you have the opportunity to speak to. Um, you're age 65 now, do I have that right? Yes. So what do you do to top this? What does the next chapter in a Nobel laureate's life look like? <laughs> well, you know, you can't really plan your life around getting a Nobel Prize. True, true. Uh, so, <laughs> um, uh, I, I will probably, I'm continuing to do, met this morning with a team of people that I'm working with on a couple of new projects and um, meeting with my teaching assistants later this afternoon for my class. I, I don't think too much will change. I want to, the interviews will come and go and then, yeah. you know, the email will subside and I'll be back to where I was. What, what's it going to be like though? I mean, just think of those teaching assistants. You you once occupied that that kind of a role and it's been a few decades since that that's happened. But what do you think is going through their mind as you sit down with, young up-and-coming scholars to be face-to-face -face with someone they know but it takes on a different hue uh, this week certainly um, I'm not a, I'm not sure it changes things too much I mean one thing I, I think that's true is uh, I've worked with lots of people um, PhD students uh, colleagues co-authors and so on and, and to some extent you know my successes reflect of all the inputs from those research assistants, you know, the, this minimum wage paper we did, we had a team of people helping us analyze the data and so on. And so if, if someone like me gets a prize, in a way, it's kind of a, a prize for the whole team. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe they get get some benefit and they're, they're, somebody will say, well, I see you were working on that project. That's interesting. Maybe they get a little bit more attention, um, a little more respect. I, I hope that's true. Well, Professor Card, uh, from all of us, congratulations, not just to you, but as you rightly say, to your team and the teams you've worked with over the years. Thanks so much for chatting with us. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.